Welcome to the Psychology Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Hoy. The Psychology Talk Podcast is a unique conversation with experts in the field of mental health from around the globe. Topics include hypnosis and mind-body treatments, ethics and cultural diversity, psychotherapy and psychiatry, emerging treatment modalities, and much, much more. While you're listening, please give us a like and subscribe to the show. It helps us to continue to provide excellent programming. And now, here is the episode. Hello, this is Dr. Scott Hoy. My guest in this interview is Dr. Stanley Krippner. Dr. Krippner is a pioneer and author in the fields of developmental psychology, parapsychology, trauma, and PTSD, and has pioneered work in cross-cultural studies with indigenous healers from around the globe. He has held faculty positions at Saybrook University and is currently faculty at the California Institute of Integral Studies. Dr. Krippner and I met last December to discuss his upcoming autobiography, A Chaotic Life. This three-volume set is published by the University Professors Press. In it, Dr. Krippner elucidates the fractal-like quality of encounters with cultural luminaries such as Mickey Hart from The Grateful Dead, Alan Watts, Rolling Thunder, and Albert Ellis. He also sheds light on the people behind the scenes who have made such meetings possible. We discuss these encounters in this interview, as well as his process of writing his memoir about these fractal events that changed the course of his life in so many ways. Incidentally, Division 30 of the American Psychological Association, the Society of Psychological Hypnosis, will be celebrating Dr. Krippner's life and work in August this year at their annual meeting. If you are a member of the APA, please feel free to look for the presentation offered by Deirdre Barrett and Ian Wickramasekra, the second. It promises to be an amazing and informative event. And now let's get into the interview. Well, well, welcome, Stan. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and uh, and uh, working through some of the glitches we've been dealing with here uh, today with some of the, the technology. Thankfully, we've got it sorted out. Um, yeah, I really wanted to to talk to you about your new book, A Chaotic Life, which is, I see it as kind of like a... Um, a, a sequel almost to Song of the Siren, which is an older autobiographical uh, work of yours. Uh, but maybe it differs. Maybe there's some difference between the two. Oh, good heaven. <laughs> oh, my God. What a question. Well, yes, this is a very good question. Um, first of all, my new book is much better written. Oh, okay. I'm not at all happy with Song of the Siren and how I wrote it. Okay. I would have done it completely differently uh, later. But let me put it this way. The material in Song of the Siren covers more or less the time that I was doing the dream research. And so it has nothing in it about what happened after I left Maimonides in the Dream Laboratory. Mm -hmm. Also, Song of the Siren doesn't spend very much time on my early years. And what I was doing before I was working in the dream research. So I think that that's a pretty good summary of the difference. Okay, okay. And so for those of you who out in the audience who don't know, Stan Krippner is, uh, well, he's a, a celebrated psychologist. He's done a lot of uh, excellent work with anomalous phenomena and psi research, which used to be called parapsychological research, uh, some very important work with dream work and sleep. And I think even before that, you were uh, kind of worked a lot with children, right? You were at Kent State for a while. Oh, good heavens, yes. There is a chapter in my memoirs dealing with my years at Kent State. 
And I returned to Kent State every so often because I still had friends in the area. Yes, when I was at Kent State, I was director of the Child Study Center, which served as a training program for graduate students who wanted to work with students and pupils with learning disabilities. I think that the work that I did there did train literally dozens of people to go back into the field and work with learning disabilities. This is at the time when there was a lot of emphasis on learning disabilities being the result of poor teaching or inappropriate parenting. And I disagreed with both of those stances. I said, no, from the research that I have read, most learning disabilities, such as dyslexia, are due to problematic functioning in the brain. And I think that later events have borne me out. But I remember, just for example, one mother who brought her son to see me, and he had been diagnosed with autism. He was not too far out on the spectrum. He was able to communicate very, very bright, had a good presentation. And his mother had been reading a book, notorious book in my opinion, by Brutal Bettelheim, The Empty Fortress, talking about how autistic people, schizophrenic people, etc., were the result of very poor mothering. So when I gave her a different diagnosis, she really was very, very happy and breathed a sigh of relief. And I was able to collect data from my work at Kent State that I turned into a number of articles on the topic of learning disabilities and also gifted children. So the years at Kent State were uh, filled with any number of activities. If I would have stayed at Kent State, I could have become a professor emeritus. I could have um, had a much easier life, but when out of the blue, I was invited to direct the Dream Laboratory at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, I actually uh, didn't think twice. And I wrapped things up at Kent State, worked with my successor so there'd be a smooth transition, and went to Brooklyn for a very uncertain future. What what caused you to jump at that particular uh, offer? You know, for better or for worse, I do a lot of things impulsively. <laughs> sometimes they work out, sometimes they're catastrophic. In this case, parapsychology had always been sort of a hobby for me. I had been following the field for years and discussed that, of course, in great detail in my memoirs. And I had been going to parapsychology meetings. I even did a parapsychology experiment with the kids who were coming to the Child Study Center and gave a transistor radio to the kid who made the most hits on the uh, test of uh, clairvoyance. And because I had been going to meetings of the Parapsychological Association, I knew the folks who invited me to Maimonides, and we were very congenial, especially Montague Ullman, who was the director of the psychiatry department at Maimonides. And so it was not all that abrupt because I had already established relationships with the people who I would be working with. And I saw this 
as an opportunity to move parapsychology in a little different direction, away from dissing cards and influencing the role of dice. We were dealing here with dreams, with actual people and their recall. Of course, the statistics, much more complicated. The experimental design, much more complicated. And at that time, I knew very little about dreams. So I had to educate myself very, very quickly. I remember when I was studying psychology at the University of Wisconsin, our course on introductory course on psychology was interesting because the professor only mentioned dream once. He said people who dream in color are always schizophrenic. My friends and I looked at each other because we all were <laughs> dreaming in color. So there was not really much that I missed out on. And the professor who said that had not been keeping up with the literature because the work at University of Chicago by Nathaniel Clayton and his associates yes, yes. had established waking a person up during a period of eye movements would almost always elicit the dream. So I familiarized myself with that literature, subsequent literature, to pull off this rather daunting feat. Okay. Wow. Okay. So you really had to go back and and re-educate or educate yourself about dreams in particular while you were taking this leap. I mean, that's 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 quite an accomplishment. Yes, I had to educate myself about dreams and what's the rest of your impression? Well, it's just quite an accomplishment to to just take such a, a 180, you know, 180 degrees uh turn from the Kent State in the, the child laboratory to to doing this dream research with parapsychology. Well, this was part of the gamble because parapsychology at that time was even further from mainstream psychology than it is today. And, of course, I was warned that this would not enhance my reputation to get involved in parapsychology. And for better or for worse, I've never really worried too much about my reputation. Yes, I probably should have from time to time, but I didn't. So when I arrived at Maimonides, part of my education was to take what I'd already learned in psychology and experimental design and apply those to a work at the Dream Laboratory. I was there for 10 years. We did a dozen different experiments that I orchestrated and designed. And again, this is a challenge to design this type of experiment. And a few years ago, a team of researchers studied all of the work that had been done in dreams and extrasensory perception for 50 years. And of course, that included our work at Maimonides. And what the review found out was that our work at Maimonides was successfully replicated at a rate very similar to repetition rates in mainstream psychology. And in giving evaluations of each experiment, I'm happy to say that none of our experiments that I had designed got very low scores. Some of the experiments got the highest score in terms of being well put together. So this gives a lie to critics who maintain two things. First of all, that parapsychological research cannot be replicated. No, not true. Not only in our dream laboratory research, others as well. Can't be replicated exactly, but you can say the same thing for mainstream psychology. Number two, when you tighten up the controls, the ESP disappears. 
No, not true. The work at Maimonides that I had designed, that was the most tightly controlled, also got some of the highest scores. So, there you have it. Wow. Well, um, that truly flies in the face of what I've been taught uh, through... Uh, and and I have dabbled a little bit in parapsychology, but but the fact that th you could actually replicate your studies uh, similarly to with other social psych and psychology research, and uh, that the controls being tightened do not throw the ESP results out, or you can reject null as well. There, uh, that's pretty amazing. Oh yes. You're probably familiar with Wikipedia, and they have a biography of me that's wrong on many, many counts. But one of the things that they state is that our work could not be replicated. And again, they simply are not, had not been doing their homework. Yeah, well, someone should point that out to them for sure. I, my friends pointed it out, the changes persist for one day, and then they're taken down. Right, that's because you Eight have a... times we've tried to make that change. Each time we were shot down. Well, that's because it's the opinion of the editor of the page, whoever the main editor is. That's that's kind of how that goes on that, on Wikipedia and other things. Um, I, I, I'm curious, uh, many people may not know what the results of your research at Maimonides showed and what kind of research you were doing. Can you explain that? When people asked me what type of research I was doing at Maimonides, it would depend upon the audience. With a parapsychological audience, I would say I was studying dream ESP. With a mainstream psychology audience, I would simply say that I was doing a content analysis of the dreams recorded in our laboratory. And then if they wanted to go further, of course I could fill in the details. Well, at Maimonides, we also did a study with dream reports, such as the dreams of pregnant women. And that has been published in a couple of places. Also, the dreams of male to female transsexuals, now called by a different name, but in those days it was called transsexuals. And we found that the dreams of the male to female transsexuals were right in the middle. They resembled typical dreams of males, typical dreams of females, each about half the time. And that study, of course, is very, very timely right now. So as I say, uh, with some audiences, I wouldn't even have to mention the ESP work because I would know that they would not appreciate it. So I had these other studies to discuss with them. But on the other hand, the International Association of the Study of Sleep and Dreams, when they had their first meeting in Brussels, Belgium, they accepted my paper on Dream ESP. And I have to say that whenever I've submitted a paper on a parapsychological topic, it's been accepted. And, of course, I choose the venues very carefully, but I've had really no problem in getting articles accepted in mainstream psychology journals and other journals as well, anthropological journals, even psychiatric journals. Okay. Uh, which I, I think that's kind of a testament to how well uh, you were able to construct your studies and how well written the papers were. The best way to answer that is to go back in the article by Lance Storm and Associates in the International Journal of Dream Research, which evaluated all of these studies of dreams and ESP, rating each study in terms of how well this was done. And 
All of our studies with Maimonides fell into the well-done or very well-done category, none in the poor categories. So this is something that I could often bring up, and I have copies of the article that I send out to people so they they read the details themselves if they're interested. Excellent. Well, maybe we can get back a little bit more to the topic of your book. Pardon me? Maybe we can get a bit closer. Maybe we can go back a little bit more to the topic of your book. We've taken a bit of a a sidestep into your dream research years. Um, Can you describe the the kind of overlay or or the outline of the book? Yeah, sure. Well, as you know, the name of the book is A Chaotic Life. And my life is chaotic in two different ways. First of all, my life has not exactly been placid. It's been very tempestuous. A lot of unpredictable things happening. A lot of plans that's never materialized. A lot of opportunities I never would have expected. So there's that type of chaos. But also, my work in chaos theory has shown me how very, very small events can have unpredictable consequences for the future. Unpredictable in the way they do not follow the ordinary cause and effect paradigm. They have a paradigm of their own. So in A Chaotic Life, I start each chapter with an incident that, as the chapter unfolds, an incident that had major consequences. Hmm. Unpredictable. And just for an example, when I was about 11 or 12 years of age, I had a premonition that my Uncle Max had died. Uncle Max and I were never that particularly close, but I admired him because he was the one person in our family who had a fair amount of money. He had a good job that was bringing more money in. And then, much to my surprise, I heard my mother scream. And I went to find out what the problem. She was on, just hanging up the telephone. Her brother-in-law, my Uncle Max, had just died suddenly at the age of about 40, 41. So I didn't tell anybody about that for a while, for obvious reasons. Thought I was crazy or something or making it up. But it led me to do reading on the topic. And there was a lot about extrasensory perception, etc., in the popular press. And then I listened on the radio to a mentalist by the name of Joseph Dunninger, and he was doing incredible things on the radio, uh, predicting headlines in tomorrow's newspaper, identifying the Social Security number, of members of the audience, et cetera. And so I later, of course, found out that it was all sleight of hand, very clever sleight of hand, of course. But that eventually led me into a study that was more rigorous of these phenomena that we now call anomalous phenomena. And just goes on from there. So 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 one incident fifty chapters has an incident that had fairly unpredictable consequences at the time. Right. I mean, example, if, if, yeah. I read an article in Life magazine in the 1970s about a shaman in Mexico who was administering psychedelic mushrooms to members of her community. And I saved that article because that really intrigued me. And I started to do more reading on the topic. Little did I realize that several years later, I'd actually be in Mexico to meet Maria Sabina, the shaman in question, and also to get involved in psychedelic research in terms of my interviews with artists and musicians whose work had been impacted by psychedelics. So each one of the chapters, as I say, 
started an incident and then sort of follows the flow as it goes off of these unpredictable directions. That's really interesting. It, it, it's kind of like uh, fractals, if you've ever seen fractals and, and yeah, how exactly. they're yeah, yeah, connected yeah. to chaos theory. Yeah. 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 Very much so. Uh, you, uh, you also kind of go in, it was nice that, that, that you were able to send me some, some chapter titles. Obviously the book's not ready for press yet or, or even pre-press, but I had a, a few chapter titles and, uh, some of them really, uh, really intrigued me. Um, maybe we can kind of go through that. For instance, um, Mandrake, I think Mandrake the Magician, is that correct? Or was he a hypnotist? Yes. Uh, I was an avid reader of comics. And one of my favorite comic strips was Mandrake the Magician, who was fighting crime. And he was, of course, a hero of the series. And from time to time, it would read, Mandrake gestures hypnotically. And as he hypnotized people, they would come up with information that needed to solve the crime, sometimes self-incriminating. So Mandrake really intrigued me, and that led me on another path because I started to read articles about hypnosis. And it got to the point where when I was in high school, I devised a little game for my friends to be initiated into our circle. People would come into the room with the rest of the members of the group, and I would give them a dish, and they would hold the dish in one hand, and the other hand, I would tell them to rotate on the bottom of the dish, and then go to the right-hand side of their face and draw the fingers down to the throat. And, of course, I was telling them they were being hypnotized, but in actuality, I put suit on the bottom, soot on the bottom of the plate, so at the end of the experiment, when they saw themselves in the mirror, their faces were streaked black with great <laughs> hilarity. Great hilarity. So that was sort of a fake hypnosis, but I wanted to study hypnosis seriously. And that, again, is something I had no opportunity to do in college. So I began to go to the training sessions of the various hypnotic societies and actually did a number of experiments with hypnosis, using hypnosis for learning disabilities, for one thing, and also seeing the similarities between hypnosis and what tribal shamans were often doing. And remember, I'm not a psychotherapist, so my work with hypnosis did not take the form of therapy, but it did lead to a number of other explorations. And I'm told the American Psychological Association, the Division for Psychological Hypnosis, is going to do a special program at the next convention, sort of honoring my work in the hypnosis field. Uh, again, great surprise. Mandrake never would have dreamed of that. <laughs> well, yes, and uh, I think everyone's looking forward to it at Division 30 of APA this year. Your, you know, the, the presentation, I think, it, it, and uh, it's great that that's that the presentation uh, honoring your work will be will be uh, presented this year. Yes. Did you mention Mark Luther King? I did not, but you did. Oh my God! Say something about I misunderstood. That. Well, of course, my memoirs has a section, my memorable meetings with Mark Luther King. Oh, Let's okay. Get back to your original question. So you've met Martin Luther King. What's more? So you met MLK. You met Martin Luther King. Well, I was at Northwest University when he became, we had the cusp of becoming famous, and he was invited to give three evening seminars at Northwest University. 
And after the second seminar, I was on my way to class, and I saw him walking down the campus pathway, and I came up to him, and I told him I'd been enjoying his lectures, and would he like a tour of the campus? So I took him on the tour of the campus and the waterfront and the interesting things, uh, pointing them out to him. And many people say, well, what did you learn? What did you question him about his work? And I said, I would prefer that he sends his energy on his seminars, not answering questions one-on-one -on -one for me. The only comment that I made on this topic, in his lecture, he was talking how he disagreed with another Nobel Prize winner, Wim Faulkner, who's counsel to the civil rights activist, go slow now. You've achieved a lot in school desegregation, so go slow now. And Martin Luther King, of course, disagreed. I agreed with him. I said, you know, Faulkner probably never read Machiavelli. And in Machiavelli's classic book, The Prince, he says, if your opponent is down, increase your pressure. Don't let them recuperate. Just keep pushing till you completely destroy your enemy. And so that was the only, shall we say, philosophical interchange. I also saw Martin Luther King on two other times. He spoke to the American Psychological Association. He spoke at Roosevelt University in Chicago. Each time I introduced myself, reminded him of our little visit at Northwestern, which he claimed to remember. And so, much to my surprise, a few years ago, at APA, American Psychological Association, a group of camera people from the media department tracked me down and wanted me to recall my encounter with Martin Luther King for a program they were doing. So again, another un unpredictable event. It, it, I'm going to step back a little bit here and just reflect on on your book. You you really seems like you're kind of you you yourself are reflecting on everything in uh, in your life through the book in this memoir, but it certainly isn't a straightforward memoir, and and you can see how. Everything is, it, it's, I'm getting the sense that you have a feeling you're connected to everything and everything is connected to you. There's there's an interchange socially and in systems that the book kind of raises that as a possible topic. What I thought would be valuable in the book would be to place my life and my activities in a historical context. Mm. And so, I have been either in the center or the periphery of many historic events, and I wanted to bring that in as a background. And not necessarily with parapsychology, which many people would not feel was a legitimate historical event, but with how that also led me into the field of what's now called consciousness studies and the background there. Also, my uh, work in desegregation when I was in the Richmond Public Schools and my small but important involvement with the desegregation and the civil rights movement. Also, good heavens, the ill fated Vietnam War, where I made several types of protests and described them in the book, again, in the historical context. And so 100 years from now or more, who people, if anybody reads this, they will probably appreciate it much more knowing the historic context of everything I did. Oh, yes, yeah. And also trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, 
my books on trauma have gotten better reviews than my parapsychology books. <laughs> and how my work with trauma goes back to a cousin of mine who was interned by the Japanese, who was a nurse in Bataan, and came back a different person. And I later realized that she had PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but that was years later. And that led, again, to another series of, of, of experiences on my part. Yeah, so the historical context, uh, I think, is a very important part of my memoirs. Well, I think in general, I, I think that uh, when you read about a historical figure or uh, a personality, it, it, how could they not be within the context of of their of the milieu, right? The social and cultural milieu. So, uh, yes, I think you're doing historians a favor. <laughs> well, yes, you reminded me of something. I should also mention, I have a lot of vignettes in the book of several people in the field who, with whom I became friends. And, for example, I'm wearing a jacket right now. Raul May's jacket. Raul May's widow gave this to me. Wow. That's perfectly a lie. Wear it, of course, with great pride. And also, my encounter with Victor Frankel and how I ended up being mentioned in one of his books. My work with Carl Rogers, uh, Charlotte Bueller, other people in the humanistic field and the transpersonal field, like Anthony Sudich, and Miles Vitch and the transpersonal crew, and Abraham Maslow, who spawned both humanistic psychology and transpersonal psychology. And I also have a big section about Albert Ellis, who I consider to be very humanistically inclined his rational mode of behavior therapy. And we became very good friends, despite his antipathy to parapsychology, although his widow tells me he was a little more broad-minded in his later years, but that really didn't affect affect our friendship. And I was able to actually speak at an institute and invited them to Europe for one of our humanistic psychology programs. So, oh, good heavens, yes, and also uh, Laura Huxley, hmm. very colorful person, very, very bright, and very, very important in the history of this field. And then, of course, the whole Harvard crew, Ram Dass, Timothy Leary, Ralph Metzner, all of whom I have had interesting encounters with, put them in the book. Yes. Wow. Wow. This is a treat. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading it. I'm looking forward to reading it, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell I, I, I hear tell that, that it's, yeah, it, it's in the midst of uh, you're, you're still working with your editors. And, and is there a publication date? Sometime in early 2024. Okay. I so, finished the book on July 1st, exactly on schedule. And they've been working with it ever since. The publisher did not give me a word count, but I took it upon myself just to end it once I hit 50 chapters. Well, that's maybe even have to be published in two volumes. I feel badly about that. Who's going to want to read two volumes, 50 chapters about my life? But maybe the context will be more interesting to them. Hmm. Well, we will find out. Well, just looking at the chapter. Leave out so much. I had to leave out so much and leave out so many people. Just can't put everything into 50 chapters. Yes. Well, that, that'll be the sequel. Oh, nah. <laughs> long enough, I can write a sequel. Good idea. Yeah. Um, well, the chapter headings look very stimulating. Uh, uh, Zelda Suplee, Queen of the Nudists. I was very intrigued. I, I, I think that the <laughs> book ought to give me a chance to do little vignettes that people who I think are important historically 
Yes. And who might have been forgotten. I have often included my work of people who are well known, like Albert Hoffman, and who needs no extra boost from me for his fame. But Zelda Supli was actually a friend of mine when I lived in New York City doing the dream research. And she owned two nudist camps. And she made some of the very earliest nudist films. They weren't pornographic, even though the, she was not wearing clothes in the movies. They were sort of heartwarming and humorous, but they were classics. And then I was, I mentioned before my work with the transsexual dreams, now we call them transgender dreams. And in my work with the transsexual dreams, I met Harry Benjamin, who was the founder of the transgender surgery in the United States. Mm. And I met, of course, many of his clients, both male to female and female to male. And he said he needed a receptionist who could interview people who were coming his way and follow up. And he said, it has to be somebody who will not be shocked if a person comes in the mail one day, a female another day. I have just the person for you. <laughs> He's one of those famous nudists in America, and nothing will faze her. So I made the connection with Zelda, and she worked with Harry Benjamin literally until the time of his death at about 100 years of age. And so she became, I think, a fairly important part of history in terms of facilitating what Harry was doing and also giving tips on makeup to the male to female tr transgender people, how to dress how to carry themselves, etc. She was more than a receptionist. She was almost what we call a co-therapist with these people. Wow. Yeah. And it was it was Zelda who came to all of our parties and events when I was in New York City. And I also got her invited to some psychology events as a representation of her work and what she was doing. Good heavens. Uh, well, it, very, very colorful. Uh -huh. And I was able to maintain contact with her up until the time of her passing, her ripe old age. So that was really one of my most heartwarming experiences with friends. And I was happy that I could include the material in in my book about her. Yeah, yeah. Well, she sounds like uh, quite the character. Well, she was introduced to me by Virginia Glenn, and Virginia Glenn will never be forgotten after my book comes out because she was so pivotal, part of the chaotic life, so pivotal in terms of introducing me to people who would become lifelong friends. Uh, Alan Watts, for example. And Virginia had a way of ingratiating herself with very, very famous people because they knew that her interest was sincere and she would never take advantage of, of them. When she went to the hospital, she had letters with her from people like Alan Watts, Timothy Leary, uh, Abraham Maslow, and the people in the hospital thought that she was delirious. One day, <laughs> Alan Watts came in to visit her, and then, of course, they had to change their mind. <laughs> well, <laughs> well uh, quite a cavalcade of interesting characters. The a theme that goes through my book, one of the many, is my interest in general semantics. 
I took a journal semantics course at the University of Wisconsin, and I use what I learn all the time, like the map is not the territory, dating Fred 1950, not the same as Fred 1960, all of that. And so when there was a general semantics conference in Hawaii when I was there, teaching assistant to Dr. Gardner Murphy, one of the big influences of my life, uh, I submitted a paper on a so-called poltergeist phenomena that I had visited. J.B. Ryan, one of the figures, of course, in parapsychology, founding yes, figures, yes. wanted me to investigate stories of a poltergeist disturbance in Iowa. My friend Arthur Hastings and I went and found out that the poltergeist disturbances were the result of a grandson not wanting to be babysitting his elderly grandparents, and so he arranged for shocking things to happen. So I reported that because obviously the map is not the territory, and I supported that at the General Semantics Conference and Hawaii, and then repeated it in the United States at another conference. And then after my spa, my talk, Virginia Glenn came running up to me and she said, you know Alan Ross, you know Timothy Lear, you know Abram, all, all the panoply of her, of her close <laughs> friends. And so she sort of added me to her retinue and introduced me to so many of those people who introduced me to even more people. So, yes, she was indeed a, uh, what we might call a strange attractor, a chaotic attractor. <laughs> well, you, you've mentioned Alan Watts a couple of times. What, what was your impression of, of uh, Alan Watts? I had uh, a great deal of contact with Alan Watts, and he never got the credit that was due for his scholarly work. People think of him as a popularizer of Eastern thought. Yes, he did that. But he also wrote some scholarly articles. And a friend of mine pulled them all together in a book, Alan Watts and the Academy. And Alan Watts never took himself too seriously. He saw himself as an entertainer. He's 50 years, I'll be forgotten. 50 years has come and gone. He's still as popular as ever. And it was my time with Alan Watts and Virginia Glenn was because Virginia Glenn arranged many of his seminars in New York City. Mm. And then, of course, I would come to the seminars, participate, have dinner with the crew. And I like to talk about Alan Watts because I consider myself a very flawed human being. Alan Watts was also very flawed, but in different ways. He was a womanizer. He was an off-again, on-again alcoholic. And as he explained it to me, he said, yes, all of that is true, but I'm what psychoanalysts would call a very oral type. I like to do things with my mouth, like drinking booze, having sex. And so he never tried to cover up his shortcomings. I wish he would have lived a little bit longer, but I actually participated in several commemorative uh, events about him and his two daughters, who put together a wonderful book of his letters, asked me to write something for the cover. Good heavens. When I first heard of Alan Watts, never did I dream that we would be spending so much time together and that we would interact in so many outstanding ways. I can well, remember one night when. I was accompanying Alan Watts to a party in his honor, if I recall, it was in Sausalito, California, and he was drunk to the gourd, as they say. <laughs> could hardly stand up. And I helped him get up the stairs into the party and over to a couch where he was capsized, and then People were expecting him to be bright and brilliant, asked, asked him questions, and he was too drunk to give a lucid answer, give a very short answer. 
Oh, they thought, how, why? He could put such wisdom into such a few words. And, of course, I didn't tell them that in his inebriated condition, they were lucky to have those few <laughs> words. And then, of course, I filled in giving more of a background in terms of his thought and what he would say to the topic. Yeah, so we pulled off that encounter pretty well. <laughs> yeah, so there are a number of little incidents like that. And, of course, in years to come, Alan Ross's drinking and womanizing will rarely be remembered, but the impact that his writing made, of course, is a part of history. He, as I said before, did popularize Eastern thought, and I would say accurately. Um, there's a debate on that, but I think when the jury is in, they'll find that he was uh, fairly faithful. And of course, he also worked with people like Suzuki, another sco uh, scholar, more intimately associated with Eastern thought. And so he really did his homework. Of course, he talked a lot about medication and Zen, and I don't think he really practiced much of them, but who am I to judge? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's certainly an inspiration. Alan Ross's son has the original tape recordings of his lectures. They're being remastered. They're still available. Yes, each one of his talks is really a gem. Not only did he write so well, he spoke so well. And I think part of the antipathy from some people in the field is that they're simply jealous that their scholarly work never reaches many people as did Alan Watts' books and tape-recorded lectures of the like. He also did make a very, very few films or videos. Thank heavens, all of that is preserved. It is available for entertainment or for scholarly purposes, sure. In the book, do you go at all into uh, your relationship with Rolling Thunder? Rolling Thunder, oh my God. Rolling Thunder, of course, is was a intertribal medicine man. And I worked closely with him for about 20 years. Uh, his grandson and I actually have two books devoting to Rolling Thunder. Rolling Thunder came my way again, by a chaotic initial conditions. I had been invited by my friend Jean Molay to a party honoring her friend Ala Raka, a noted toddler player, a communist yes. of Ravi Shankar. And Jean said, there's a drummer coming who wants to talk to you about hypnosis. Mr. Five, be happy to see him. And so the drummer arrived, Mickey Hart of the Grateful Dead, didn't know it at the time. Mickey arrived, black ponytail, black and white, harlequin suit, very dramatic. And he didn't want to join the party, he just wanted to talk to me about hypnosis because he was hypnotizing some of his students. So we went off to a private room and I listened to his story. And what he was doing was actually using hypnosis to facilitate his students' music lessons. Mickey was a multi-percussionist, but he also played several other instruments. Very, very talented guy. So I, what he was doing was really more of a guided imagery than a hypnosis. That's aware that any harm could come to. So I gave him some tips. We were just about to end the conference. He was up heading for the door. He, By the way, do you like rock music? Said, I love rock music. Just two nights ago, I went to hear the Grateful Dead. <laughs> and then he spoke. Then you heard me play. What would have happened if he had not made that question? My life would have been very different. Because once he knew that I was an aficionado, of rock music and the Grateful Dead, he invited me to his ranch, and he said, I've got to introduce you to Rolling Thunder, this medicine man friend of mine. So one night, Mickey and the Grateful Dead were playing 
the small venue, and during the intermission, who should I see coming down the aisle but this stalwart, good-looking Native American gentleman with a little feather in his cap, a beautiful woman on each arm, and he came down, and I said, you must be Rolling Thunder. You must be Dr. Krepner. So <laughs> that is how we met. <laughs> and, of course, the stories are legion about my work with Rolling Thunder. I actually got him a number of invitations, including a trip to Europe, where I was able to introduce him to a crowd in Germany filled up an entire auditorium. They were so eager to contact him. And it was quite a rewarding experience for me. And I'm happy that I was able to invite him to so many events where he sort of share his knowledge and illuminate people on Cherokee Shoshone lore. Those are his two tribal affiliations. I always have to say this because not all Native American philosophy is alike. There were probably 500 tribes in what today is the United States when the Europeans invaded. There still are a couple of hundred registered tribes in the United States. Many of them are very, very different. So my work with Rolling Thunder uh, produced... A lot of merriment and a lot of wisdom. You're absolutely right. Mm, yeah. Well, uh, I know someone who uh, who's friends with uh, an Anishinaabe uh, shaman, uh, medicine man, and uh, he thinks highly of, of Rolling Thunder and his work. Oh, I'm happy to hear that. That's great. Yeah. So he thinks he's legitimate. A lot of, you know, I know that there's some criticisms of him as there is for everybody who's in the limelight, but uh, I think he's respected, generally speaking. Uh, yeah. Well, I think, Stan, we could probably wrap up here. Uh, your, your book is called A Chaotic Life, and it's coming out probably sometime in early 2024. But even though you're saying it's chaotic, it sounds like there's a thread that goes through it that it has reason and 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 meaning to it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think that's... Can you maybe speak to that? Yes, just to review, each of the chapters starts with an incident, a very small incident, like my reading Mandrake the Magician comic book, for example. And then that unfolded a lot, if you use your term, fractals going off and reproducing themselves in very different ways. And so I've tried to chart that in the book to give it sort of an innovative approach. And then in addition to that, yes, there's been a lot of chaos in my life, a lot of disappointments, a lot of catastrophic mistakes that I've made. And so I do not want the book to be a obituary or a hagiography. Hmm. As they say, there it is, like warts and all. <laughs> okay. Well, I appreciate the fact that you're doing this. I appreciate the fact that you've spent time with me today. And I, I very much look forward to uh, reading A Chaotic Life. Oh, thank you very much. I hope I don't have to wait too long. Thank you. <laughs> oh, me too. I'm looking for it. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for listening. Did you know the Psychology Talk podcast is all over the World Wide Web? Well, not entirely all over, but we are in social media and we do have a website. Pop over to www.psych-talk.com to find out more about the show. All material is copyright, the Psychology Talk podcast. Opinions of our guests are not necessarily those of the host or the show. Material is provided for entertainment and informative purposes only. If you need a mental health professional, please seek one out. Music is provided by the band Serenati. <laughs>